I love those songs, and I appreciate the excellent way in which they were sung this morning. I want to just say just a moment before we get into the message how thankful I am for your faithfulness to be here to church on Sundays and for the services. This is, um, of course, Bible Sunday. I'd like to encourage you to make sure you have a good Bible. And uh, at the bookstore, there are some Bibles available. They're on 15% off today. If you want to buy them today, there are some defined Bibles. I like them, especially because they define any words in the uh, King James Bible right there on the same page. The difficult words that we don't use as much are become a little bit more uh, spare in, in the way we use them in our common day vernacular. I love the King James Version of the Bible. That's the only Bible I have any interest in listening to in English. And um, But... You, there are some words that are a little challenging for us. Every word that's challenging is, is defined at the bottom of the page, so you can look over that. Those are available. I don't think they're in yet, but you can get your coupon today when you go to the bookstore. I believe it's out these doors and to the right. If I'm wrong, get directions from someone who knows where things are around here. <laughs> but uh, you can go out there and you can get, you a, get a coupon so you can come back next week and purchase it when they're in stock. We do have a, a there is a, a Bible, it's just called the Strand Bible. I can't say I agree with everything in there, just like I don't agree with all the, the it is a King James Version of the Bible, so I'm safe with that, but even um, the Schofield Bible teaches the gap theory, which I would disagree with strongly, things of that nature. But I do believe you'll find some things in here that could be a help to you, and uh, we received a uh, large quantity of these several years ago. I found that they were here, and I wanted to make them available for $20, and it's a resource. It's not one you'd probably put in your, and bring to church with you on Sunday morning, but it is one I think you can use as a, as a resource and study for you. It does talk about how to identify cults, outlines every single chapter of the Bible, so you kind of have an idea about uh, what is in each chapter. If you, if you said, oh, what's in Luke chapter? Eight. You could go to the beginning of Luke and it would, it would outline what's in Luke chapter 7, 8, and 9 to show you what's there. It could be of help to some of you. As I thought about that this week, I thought I wanted to make that available to you. But I sure appreciate your faithfulness. I want to thank all those who came to the Homecoming Bible Conference. I believe that God used that meeting in a very special way in my heart, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I believe that God worked in us very much. And I'm, I, if you did not get to come or you missed a service here or there, I would encourage you to go by the counter and purchase a CD of maybe one of the services. Tuesday, uh, Thursday night was fantastic. Of course, Wednesday night for the Johnny Pope. Each of the evenings on, on a Tuesday night, uh, Give God a Chance was spoken by... Uh, Brother Cox, it was a great truth. I'd love to get every one of you to hear that. You can get that by CD. And then on Wednesday morning, there's one on Wednesday morning that talked about an issue you, everyone, must learn how to deal with. And it's how to deal with a Saul in your life, somebody who has hurt you. How to deal with that. How to deal with somebody who, who's really, seems like they've stayed up at night thinking of ways they can complicate your life. Uh, how to deal with that. That particular one, we, we, I, I, I asked the uh, CD by demand to make it available for $1. I don't know what the other ones are. I think they're 2 or $3. But that one, I want to get everybody who would, who would care to listen to that message by Dr. Charles Keene. Uh, I think it would be very helpful to you. But most of you are here to hear those messages. But if you did not get to hear, I hope that you will get those and consider those. I sure love you. I feel so honored to be a part of the First Baptist Church of Hammond. Thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord. And uh, thank you for what you do for Jesus. As we are in our fall program, I'm excited about all the things that God is doing. I'm excited to see people get baptized this morning. If you're excited about that, would you say amen? amen. That's a wonderful thing. I'm excited about the possibility of seeing people get saved. This morning, I had the joy to go out to the Indiana State Prison here this morning. I left my house about 515 and went down there and preached to about 210 men there in the prison. At the end of the service, several of them accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, and others made decisions for, for living for the Lord. It was an honor and a joy to be a part of that and then be back here and then go to discipleship and see a room full of new Christians learning the Bible and growing the Scriptures and then to come and see you here. Thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a wonderful privilege to go to church with you. If you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter number 10. That's where we read our scriptures there when the old, old man read the scripture with us there. <clears throat> Appreciate Brother Colston. What a wonderful servant of God and what a sweet friend. 
that God has given us in him and for his faithfulness through the years and his precious wife is uh, just unbelievable. And I appreciate the, the joy of being able to serve God in these days with them. Hebrews chapter 10, of course, uh, it is kind of summing up the end of the, ch end of the book of the Bible. Hebrews has one theme, and that is to convince you and I that Jesus is better. He is worth it. Whatever you have to do to get to Jesus, it will be worth it. Whatever you have to do to please Jesus, it will be worth it. Whatever you have to give up to come to Jesus, it will be worth it. Jesus is better. He is God in the flesh. He is the image of the Godhead bodily in person. He's better than angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than the Old Testament law. He's better than rituals or rites or the church, if you will. He is it. That in all things, he might have the preeminence. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. Because he's writing to some people who've given up an awful lot because they love the Lord Jesus Christ and have chosen to accept him, but they're starting to scratch their head. And they said, you know what? It's been difficult since I came to Jesus. There's been some hard times. And friends, loving Lord and loving Christ and pleasing him is not a walk in the park. There are some challenges. It is much easier to watch two hours of television than it is to read your Bible for two minutes. It's much easier to work for eight hours than it is to pray for eight minutes. There's something about this. This world is built to keep me from getting to know Jesus Christ and trying to please him. My own selfishness, society as it is, and even satanic opposition challenges me to love, serve, and pursue Jesus Christ. But the greatest and the most happiest people who ever lived have put Jesus Christ as their goal. Growth is not our goal here at First Baptist Church of Hammond. Jesus should be our goal. Amen. Money should not be your goal. You chase money, you're going to find yourself chasing your shadow. You'll never catch it. But turn around and run to Jesus, and you might be surprised what would follow you in that process. When we seek first him, his kingdom, and his righteousness, all these other things can be added unto us. But Jesus is where it's at. And here in, Act, in Hebrews chapter 10, it's getting ready to sum up the entire book of this Hebrews. He's used the first 10 chapters and said, listen, Jesus is better. And someone said, well, what about the, the blood of bulls and goats that were sacrificed years ago? He says, those could not forgive sin, but Jesus could. God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. You're in chapter 10. Look real quick at a couple verses where the Bible says in verse number 10, by the which, we, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Read the three words there, once for all. Hey, that priest had to sacrifice again tomorrow. And he had to sacrifice after that. Hey, when Jesus went to the cross, it was finished, friend. Once and for all, he sacrificed. That king, that priest would stand and have to sacrifice. There was no place for the king to sit down, or excuse me, the priest to sit down on his duties. That's why at the age of 50, they were no longer able to do the priesthood. They began to become a supervisor rather than doing the work of sacrifices because it would require much labor, and they had to stand. There was no place to sit down. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 11. But every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes throughout the day the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. But... This man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, notice what he says there, read the rest of it, sat down at the right hand of God. Well, all the priests, there's no place to sit down, but Jesus, when he sacrificed, he sat down. What does that mean? The price has been paid. He doesn't have to go back there tomorrow. There is no more need of, of any other sacrifice. He is the sacrifice acceptable to God. If you're here today, you're not sure if you were to die, you'd go to heaven. Listen, let me encourage you, come to Jesus. Only Jesus can forgive sin. You can't forgive your own sin. I can't forgive your sin. I can't forgive my own sin. The baptistry waters are wonderful, and after you're saved, you need to be baptized. But those waters cannot wash away sin. No amount of sacraments or ordinances can wash away sin. Nothing can wash away sin but the blood of Jesus Christ. 
That's exciting. It's worth getting excited about. However, verse number 17, the Bible says this, And their sin and their iniquities will I remember no more. What a wonderful truth. When you're forgiven by God, He remembers your sin no more. When it came to your sin, He chose not to remember it. The Bible says as far as the east is, from the west. Hey, I got my directions right, I think. The east is, from the west, so far hath God removed our transgressions from us. The Bible tells you he put it in the deepest sea. Puts up a no fishing sign. You can't go back to that thing. Not going to pull those things out. He doesn't pull up your past and show you what he did. Now, when you have that happen, when you've already confessed and forsaken your sin, you can guarantee yourself one thing. That's not God talking to you. That's not the Spirit of God. That's the devil. He works on guilt, making you feel like you're not worthy, that you're, you're not worth it. Let me say to you, conviction from the Spirit of God always drives you back to Jesus and to his forgiveness. Con guilt from Satan drives you back to yourself. You never had answers for that, and you can't forgive your sin. You must believe and receive him, but he doesn't remember our sin anymore. By the way, when he looks at you and me, if we've been saved and accepted Christ, he sees you just as perfect as his son, Jesus Christ. That's what justification means. Verse 18, the Bible says, And now, where remissions, the remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. He said, when you've been forgiven, there's no need to go back and have another offering for sin made. Having, therefore, brethren, Christians speaking specifically, Boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We can, we can go to the throne of God because we have the blood of Christ upon our sin and upon our soul. By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God. He says, now listen, this is all good news. And I've told you, if you're saved this morning, if you could just get a little bit of Christianity, by a little bit of thinking on that, you ought to say... Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're not going to remember my sin anymore. Thank you that my sins have been forgiven, removed from your memory, never to be brought up again. That's a good thing. And you have a high priest that ever liveth, making intercessions for you and I. It's a good deal being a Christian. It's the best thing I know. But he says, now, because of this, Wilkerson, because of this, sir, and because of this man, if you are saved... Pay attention because here's the admonition. Here's the what for. Here's the so what about it. Once you're saved, you know you're going to heaven. Your sins have been forgiven. It's under the blood of Christ. He suffered for your sins. You'll never suffer a lake of fire. Then what about that? So what? What can you do now? Are you just glad to have fire insurance and know you're not going to hell? No, there's some things that you need to consider. He said, now, because of that, let us. Now, look at there, if you will, please. That is not a vegetable you put on your hamburger, okay? Let us. Let us draw, to get, draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil what? And our bodies washed with pure water. Here, I believe, the first thing he says, listen, if you're saved, and I'm saving, and primarily every time I get to speak, the church is for Christians. If you do not know Jesus Christ, do not pass go, do not collect $200, go right to the front as soon as we get done here and say, someone help me get to heaven from here. Someone show me from the Bible how I can be saved. Because the rest of my message today is going to be just not applicable. But if you are saved... Here's what God wants us to do. He said, now look, if you're saved, you've, been, you've had the high priest Jesus Christ, then he said, why don't you draw near to him in personal devotion? In personal devotion. Listen, friend, there's no way in the world I could preach a message strong enough, thorough enough, that you could survive on it for a whole week. No more than you can eat your Sunday afternoon lunch and that keep you all week long. No, you need, to, you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to spend time with the Lord in personal devotion. He said, look, if you're saved, then draw near to God in full assurance of faith. And he says, now, there's two things you'll need to do. Number one, you'll need to purify your wicked heart and my wicked heart from an evil conscience. That are, those are sins of the Spirit. Those are attitudes that you and I have. And actions that we have. He said, there are some things we do. Now, there are some folks, they wouldn't think 
of robbing a 7-Eleven store or robbing a bank or cussing a blue streak, but you got some attitude issues. You got some sins of the spirit, if you will. Take your Bibles, if you would please, and hold your place here to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 7, please forgive me. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Love to hear pages of the Bible turn. Thanks for bringing your Bible. Going to church without a Bible is like going to a football game without a football. You need both of those things. It's your Bible when you come to church. You get a good Bible, one you love and enjoy reading. Make your good friend. Chapter number, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 speaks about spiritual separation. Chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians says, number 1, Having therefore these promises that God will be our Father, will be His child, we're separated to Him. He said, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let me just say something to you, friend. God is not going to make you meet with Him. He's not going to make us have our personal devotions. See, things that are not urgent usually clamor for our attention. But things that are important wait for you to move on. He's not going to tell you, you get to meet with me at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning or else. No, he waits for you. And this is why the Bible said, let us meet with him. See, when you got saved, he came to you. He did all the work to convict you, convict you and I to convince us that only Jesus could save us. And we came to him. He did all the work except him. But when I say to your personal walk, you must come to Jesus. Let us draw near to the Lord. You can be as close to God as anybody in this room. Sometimes we look at pastors and leaders and we say, well, those guys are spiritual. Let me tell you, you can be just as spiritual as anybody you can be just as spiritual as the Apostle Paul. The difference between Apostle Paul and me is that he was consumed with Jesus. And I try to keep him on the radar, but not as good as he does. Let us draw near. You can be as near to God. Draw nigh to God. What will he do to you? He'll draw nigh to you. So the first point here is about personal devotions. Spending time personally with the Lord because you got two problems. Attitudes of the Spirit an attitude and uh, sins of the spirit and sins of the flesh. Sometimes spiritual sins of failing to forgive someone who's hurt you. Sometimes it's not asking someone to forgive you that you've hurt. Lots of things we can do. Sometimes it's prejudice things. You see someone and you, you think bad about them. You don't tell them. They don't even know it, but you have issues because you have a conscience that's not clear of offense. It bothers you. Oh, when the Spirit of God tells you, you owe someone money and he convicts you about paying them back or going to them and working through it. And you just put that off. That's a sin of the Spirit. But then there's also sins of the flesh. And oftentimes that is immorality, fornication that should not be named, should be talked about. You're not going to be one with God till you're two with sin. You can't love flowers and not hate weeds. And you're not going to draw near to God. The closer you get to him, the more you're going to see he's going to illuminate your sinful attitudes and my sinful attitudes and my sinful actions. He said, number one, why do I need to spend time drawing near to God? Because getting close to God illuminates my sin and I don't like it. I don't know, you know, some people don't like, the Bible says that men love darkness, red and lights because their deeds are evil. Why people don't go to church very frequently. That's why you can't get in your Bible because what the Bible says contradicts how you and I live sometimes. That's why you ought to be faithful to hear the Word of God and you need it. It's like a guy is sleeping all night and they turn the light on. Turn the light off! All the bars are dark. There's darkness going on in there. Don't want to expose that. That's sometimes the way we are, but he says, number first of all, if you're saved, then he says, I want you to draw near to God. In, in assurance, and cleanse yourself spiritually. By the way, the closer we get to God, the more illuminated we see ourselves, and we say, you know what? I'm in trouble. Isaiah chapter 6 tells us that. In the year that Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his glory filled the temple. Boy, they begin to, he began to see God. See, oh, Uzziah, Uzziah was his king, and he loved Uzziah. And Uzziah was a person, pay attention up here, guys in the balcony, pay attention, please. Hey, he, he saw him. 
He saw Uzziah, and that was his hero, and, and now Uzziah is dead. Now he sees the Lord. And by the way, he said after he sees the Lord in his beauty, in his, in his light, in his, in his radiance, he says, man, woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live with a bunch of people that are just like me. What happened when he sees the Lord high and lifted up? When he gets closer to Jesus, you, you, you all of a sudden, your little pride goes down quick. How good do you feel about yourself and your, and, your, and, your, and your spirituality? It sinks in a hurry. See, if we're saved, then draw near to God. By the way, when you, when you, feel, when you realize how much you need God, you, we, you and I are not very critical of other people. You realize, you know what? I'm not going to go around criticizing other people. I think I got to help myself. I'm in trouble. Well, let's look at the next verse, if you would please. Look at verse number 23. Personal devotions, 23, it says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now, this is a, this is a, a personal profession or testimony for Christ. He said, if you're saved, then draw near to God and then realize that everybody's watching you. You may be the one, you may be only one person in the world, but you're the world to one person. And someone is watching you, neighbor. Someone's watching you at work. Now, they're, 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 they're not ready to hear what you have to say, but they're watching you. He said, now hold fast that public profession of faith, that profession, if you really say, don't waver. That means don't be on one side and the other. Stand fast, knowing that God is faithful. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Your testimony is so important, friend. You're the only Bible this careless world will read. You're the sinner's gospel. You're the scoffer's creed. You and I may be the Lord's last message, given in deed and word. What if the type is crooked? What if the print is blurred? What if our hands are busy doing other things than his? What if our feet are walking where sin's allurement is? What if our mouth is speaking of things this life would spurn? How can we hope to serve our Lord and welcome his return? Listen, friend. Uh, if you're saved, draw near to God in personal devotion. And then have a personal profession that's believable. One guy started to witness to his friend. He says, your life is so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. He said, I can't get over what you're saying because your life is so messed up. You're telling me I need to do this, but you act like a heathen. You act just like me. Tell me you got something I want. I don't think so. That's why a testimony is so important. That you be a good testimony. Be a good testimony. Work hard. Be truthful. Keep your temper in check. Let the Spirit of God. By the way, you'll do that if you spend time with the Lord. See, a, a godly testimony is birthed out of a personal devotion with the Lord. Personal devotion, personal profession and testimony. And I plead with you. Man, listen, especially in your own house. Daddy, Mama. Be real good. And once I get to some idiot, say, I'm real, man. I keep it real. <laughs> You're just real bad. That's all there is. How about being really godly? Amen. How about not being a hypocrite? Doesn't mean to come to church and, and, and be an idiot here at church like you are at home. How about just trying to be a good person here at church and being a good person at home too? Amen. Be a good testimony to our children, to our wife, to our neighbors, to our friends. Hey, listen, you want to have that? You might want to birth that out of a, if you're saved, then out of a personal devotion with the Lord. And then a public profession, a personal profession of faith and testimony with the Lord. Look at the next verse, if you would please, in verse number 24. And let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works. This is a personal consideration this is interesting. The Bible says we ought to prefer one another. That means I ought to think about my brothers and sisters in Christ and think about this. I need to have a, a personal consideration. Listen, the Bible says no man lives himself in Romans 14. No man dies to himself. You are not an island. Everybody looks at you and you're responsible for your brother. Remember Cain? When God came to find Abel and basically just want to see where Cain was? He said, Cain, where's your brother? It's not my day to watch him. Am I my brother's keeper? 
The truth of the matter is, yes, you are. It is you. It's on your watch to love your brother. What are you supposed to do with your brother or your sister? He said, I want you to have personal consideration for them. To do what you can to provoke your brother to love and the good works. To love God and others more and do more for God and others. I have a responsibility to you. You have a responsibility to me. Brother, you have a responsibility to your brother. And sister, you have a responsibility to your sister. And Sunday school worker, you have a responsibility to your teacher. And teacher, you have a responsibility to your Sunday school t- your class. And bus worker to each other. All of us ought to have something. We are supposed to have a personal consideration to my brothers and sisters. That's why you ought to be in church faithfully. Because your presence means something to people. We're going to have church whether you came or not today because you came, it's better. Thank you for coming. And it's better to have you here than nobody here. It's better to have a, a full row than a row with just, a, just, a, 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 just one or two people sitting on it. Say, Pastor, how can I consider my brother and sister and, and provoke them to love God and others more and do more for God and others? First of all, you can just be present. You can just show up. Be in your place. Be in your Sunday school class. Be on that bus route. Be in the choir. Be in the orchestra. Wherever it is you're supposed to be. Be in the service. Number two, participate. Participate. This Saturday morning, we're going to have a Super Saturday Soul Winning. Once a month, we invite folks to come out specifically, earmark two hours of your month, to go out and after we leave here, and, and, and share the gospel with someone. Take a box, of, take a pack of tracks, or, or, or go with a bus captain and visit one of the bus captains' route. Or go to a nursing home and walk the halls of a nursing home and encourage somebody. Go make a visit of someone who's visited us and just thank them for coming. Well, you say, Pastor, I really love my church. I really love Jesus. Well, I think you ought to consider helping your brother and sister by coming and participating in that. I'm not trying to manipulate you. You can do what you want to do. No one's counting heads. If you don't come, we're not going to probably notice. But if you did come, you'd encourage somebody. You'd earn eternal rewards when you stand before the Lord. I think some of us need a revival of rewarding. Let me tell you something. You can't earn your way to heaven. If you can earn your way to heaven, then why would Jesus have to die on the cross? Can't do that. The secret of eternal life is to learn that it cannot be earned. But let me say to you something, Spanky. Whenever you get saved, there is a reason to serve God. There is a reason to give. There is a reason to be faithful. And you say, what does it help me? I'm telling you what, you won't be saying that 30 million years from today. What was the big deal about attending church, about giving to the church? And I'm trying to do right and I have bad things. I think I'm going to quit. You won't be saying that a thousand years from now. And maybe just in a few days when you stand before Jesus, you won't be saying that either. By and by, when I look on his face, beautiful face, tear-stained face, by and by, when I look on his face, I wish I had given him more, more, so much more, more of my life than I ever gave before. By and by, when I look on his face, I wish I had given him my Saturday. I wish I'd have made that visit. I wish I'd given out that gospel track. I wish I'd have visited on that bus route. I wish I'd gone to that nursing home. My wife and kids went to nursing home yesterday and walked the halls and sang songs to a few people. Went in there and saw, saw our friend of ours who's, who's in the hospital bed there and with a stroke and, and walked in. And boy, he, he, he's been looking at those, those same walls for several weeks. Walked in, and he saw the kids, and we sang a few songs, and he just smiles, so happy. Thank God he's already saved. There's other people in there not saved. Able to give gospel tracks to people, fun, fun ones. See one of the workers take the track, and I love these tracks. I appreciate the, Miss uh, Carol Hunter helping get them printed for us. And talks, talks about the gospel, and then there's that little place there they can put their iPhone on and see it, sit out in the porch on their smoke break, and... and uh, Read, read that, listen to someone explain the gospel to them. I don't know if the person got saved, but I tell you what, I, I'm glad I, go, I went. I think I'm going to be glad I did when I, when I stand before the Lord one day, too. Hey, personal devotion. Personal profession of testimony. Then a personal consideration of my brothers and sisters. What can I do to help them 
love others. Love God and others more and do more for God and others. And the last thing this morning in closing is a personal participation in his church. Read verse 25 with me, if you would please. Everybody ready? Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is. Come into church. Boy, it's a good group today. But were you here last week? Are you going to be here next week? We had Sunday school today. Did you, did you go to Sunday school class? Or maybe you're just so spiritual you don't need Sunday school. That's for little kids. Listen, friend, I don't want to be harsh with you, but the Bible says don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together like some people do. Now, God knew that there would be people who just don't get it. They don't, they, they're not going to attend church. They don't think it's important. But let me tell you something. Church is not your idea. It's not my idea. It's God's idea. People would come together and they would hear God's word and be challenged to, to trust God more and to believe him more and obey him more. And then encourage others to do the same thing and then take the gospel to an unsaved world after we leave here. It's God's plan. This next week, I want to encourage you. Make sure you're in church on Sunday. Make sure you're in a Sunday school class. Say, well, I haven't been in Sunday school in a while. Fix that next week. Get yourself in a Sunday school class. Get your kids in a Sunday school class. Boy, you got children. Get them in a Sunday school class. I was reading this article this week, and this is a blessing to me. It was, uh, it was an article, uh, a study done by Duke University, Indiana University, University of Michigan, the, the Center for, for Disease Control, Barna Research Group, and the National Institute of Health Care. It is a program in which you can, it's free, that you can benefit your children if you will participate. And here's what will happen. They say that if you do this, you will increase the life expectancy of your child by eight years. You will significantly reduce their, in, their use and increase or risk of alcohol, drugs, and tobacco addiction. You will dramatically lower their risk of suicide as much as 70%. You will help them rebound from depression much faster if they ever go in that state. You will dramatically reduce their risk of committing a crime. You'll improve their attitude at school and increase their school participation. You'll reduce the risk of rebelliousness. You'll reduce the likelihood that they would binge drink alcohol, causing damage to themselves and others. You'll improve their odds for a happy, a very happy life. You'll provide them with a lifelong moral compass, and you'll get them to wear their seatbelts more often. If you get them to go to church, that's what it's called. Then these people says here actively participate in the faith community. If you get your, if you get you, and it helps not only the children, it helps, it helps the adults. Why? Because faith cometh by hearing by the word of God. Once you decide next week, I'll be in Sunday school. And I have a visitor with me because somebody's not going to come. So bring somebody to take that person's place. Get in that situation. Next week is our special week of church attendance Sunday. Don't miss a Sunday school class. Be where you're supposed to be. Let the word of God dwell in you because we need to be provoked for personal devotion. We need to be provoked for a personal profession of a good testimony. Personal consideration of my brothers and sisters in Christ and then personal participation in the work and church of the Lord. Let's pray together, can we? Thank you for your attendance and your attention today. You've listened so well, and I appreciate that. You're always a good listening group, and today is no exception. But with heads bowed and eyes closed, it's not a time to leave. Unless you're ill, please sit tight just for a moment, if you would, please. I preach for today primarily to my friends who go to church here at First Baptist Church of Hammond, who have already, most of which, have accepted Christ as their Savior. But I also understand that just like me, one day on a Sunday night, I sat in an auditorium like this, and I knew that if I were to die, I'd gone to hell. I was not saved. I knew it, and God knew it. And I was convicted. Every time the preacher mentioned hell, it bothered me. 
Because I knew I was going there because I had not believed and received Jesus once and for all. And it, it concerned me. It was at that service that someone took the Bible and showed me how I could be saved. If you're here today, you say, Pastor, I'm just like that. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. If you're here like that today, would you lift your hand and say, Pastor, with heads bowed and eyes closed, you, would you pray for me? Hold your hand up, would you? Anybody like that? I see you in the balcony, several in the balcony. God bless you. Down here, God bless you. I was just like you one day. Anybody else over here to my left? I see you. I'm looking. Anybody else say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure if I die to go to heaven. God bless you, sir. Thank you very much for being honest about that. Other others, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure if I die to go to heaven. How about over here on my right? Anybody like that? Lift your hand and say, Pastor, I'm not sure if I die to go to heaven. Please pray for me. How about the balcony? Anybody there? Please don't talk to anyone. God bless you. If you, um, if you raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. Everybody else, heads bowed, eyes closed. If you look at me just for a second, let me just tell you what I'd do if I were you. If I were you, I'd want the answer to that question. Knowing what I know now, I really want you to have the answer to that question. And it's not hard. God loves you, and he wants to save you. He wants to forgive your sin. He wants you to have eternal life. This church is prepared in just a moment. We're going to all stand in just a moment. The choir is going to sing. What you can do is you just step out where you are, wherever you are. If you're in the balcony, you come down the outside here. We'll meet someone, meet you right there at the base of that steps and over here. And you can just tell them, could someone show me how to be saved? And a man with a man, a lady with a lady is going to take a Bible and sit down here in one of these pews and explain the gospel to you. If you have questions, you can ask it. If you're not comfortable, you can stop them anytime. It is just a chance to get the gospel to you. It was the best day of my life when someone explained this to me. I want you to be explained to too. So when we be saying, would you step out and come? I think that's what I would do if I were you, and I hope you'll do it. If you are saved, but you say, Pastor, God's dealt with me about my personal devotions. It's anemic. My testimony is being hurt for Jesus. And I've not thought about my brothers and sisters and how I can help them. And I want to be faithful to the work of God. If God's dealt with you about that, I would just encourage you as soon as we sing, don't. If God would talk to you about something, talk back to him in words of confession and agreement. If you need to be baptized this morning, you've already been saved. When you get baptized, you can come right away. We're ready to do that. <laughs> Excited about that opportunity. Let's stand together and we'll pray. Can we do that?